Hi, um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Cara Pogger and I am an associate professor at the University at Old Albany in upstate New York. Um, I am also associated with the RNA Institute. So I'm really excited to give this talk to you today to tell you about um, RNA modifications and particularly how they can actually land up changing during a viral infection. But also the amazing thing is that these modifications are also found on cells. Um, these modifications are also found on the viral RNA. All right, so if I take you, um, let's just go back here. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is that I'm essentially going to cover four things. So first is I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of modifications on DNA and protein as a way of a preface for talking about RNA modifications. And then I'm gonna tell you about how these modifications are actually detected and the strategy that we use to detect modifications. And then lastly, I'm gonna share with you some data that we have, a little bit of it is published, some of it is unpublished, um, looking at RNA modifications during Zika virus infection. So if I take you to the central dogma, right? We know that we have our genetic material that is encoded in our DNA. From there, we can get mRNA that is transcribed and this mRNA acts as a messenger to produce your proteins. Now, if I asked you this question, right? Is there a cipher or a code that regulates biological molecules? You probably already think of maybe one or two possible codes. So the first is the epigenetic code, right? So this is modifications that are occurring on histones, and these can be modifications such as a methyl group or an acetyl group, a phosphorylation group, or even a simulation group that is on the histones. And what this does is that it either allows the, uh, the DNA to be more compact associated with um, the histones, or to loosen it up so that you can now have a um, transcriptionally active region inside of the DNA, all right? So the second type of modification would be perhaps one that you thought of as and that is the modifications that are on proteins. And here we actually have got a plethora of modifications. Um, and these modifications are really important for localizing a um, protein to a particular area for regulating whether a protein is turned on or turned off, um, as well as its specific interactions with different types of proteins. So if I come back to the slide, you've probably thought about the um, cipher or codes that are on DNA and proteins. But what about RNA? And so that's really what I'm gonna be telling you about today. So if you think about RNA, you're familiar with the four canonical nucleotides, right? Adenine, guanine, cytidine, and uridine. So when I'm talking about modification, what's, what I'm talking about are chemical marks that are placed on the RNA. So here I'm giving you an example of five different types of modifications that are on um, adenosine. So one is this methyl group that is placed on the ribose sugar, or you can have methyl groups that are placed on the nucleotide base, the nitrogenous base over here. So here you've got one methyl adenosine, two methyl adenosine, N6, um, N6 methyl adenosine, and here you have even got two methyl groups placed on the nitrogenous base. But one thing I wanna point out to you here is that here I am showing you just five modifications on one nucleotide. What you might not or might not, what you might or might not realize is that there are actually more than 140 modifications. In fact, in some databases, they even list more than 170 different modifications. I mean, this is just really mind blowing. So if you're thinking to yourself, like, wow, so many modifications, what are these modifications doing? Well, the truth is for a lot of them, we actually don't really understand what they do. But for some of those, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about what they do. Now, if we look at an mRNA over here, 
there is a modification that's been known since the 70s. And here, this is the modification that is on um, the beginning of an mRNA or the 7-methylguanosine cap, such as I've shown you over here. Now, this cap is really important to a messenger RNA. Why is it important? Well, it's important because if that RNA is not capped, it's not going to be exported out of the nucleus. That cap is important for stabilizing the RNA, but what it's also really important for is for translation. So that's one modification. What about another modification? So another one that I'm going to introduce you to is this N M6A or N6-methyladenosine. So the way that these modifications are put on to RNA, they can be dynamic in that you can have particular enzymes that actually install the modifications. And these enzymes are known as writers. And for M6A, we actually know what those writers are. Let's say these, some of these modifications are dynamic, so they can also be removed. And here we have erasers that are able to move them. So you've got these enzymes that put them on and take them off, but what about proteins that actually help with a particular function? Well, these proteins are known as readers. And for M6A, we actually know that there are a number of different readers. And what these readers do is that they actually help um, give function to that particular modification. So for instance, this M6A can influence alternative splicing. It can influence the export of the RNA out of the cell, as well as the stability. So some RNAs that have got this modification on them, when they're associated with the reader, will actually be processed and sent to the processing body where you get RNA turnover. Now this one modification over here, the M1A or N1 methyladenosine, this modification we know is important for translation. But now I'm going to remind you about the fact that there are 170 different modifications. So keep that in mind. Now I've shown you about RNA modifications that are on cellular RNAs, right? So I've shown you three examples. But what about viral RNAs? Well, it actually turns out that we have known about RNA modifications in part because of viruses. So that modification of the cat, the M7G, um, we've known about because of vaccinia virus and reovirus. Now, this one modification, M6A, which I keep referring to, um, is a modification that is really well characterized. And we've known about this modification, again, since the late 70s and early 80s, because it was already identified on simian virus 40 mRNA, influenza virus mRNA, and Ralph sarcoma virus RNA. So even though this modification was identified in the early 70s or late 70s, the renaissance of this particular modification and really the functional impact came about from studies that were published in 2016 from Tariq Rana's lab, where he beautifully showed that this one particular modification, this M6A on HIV, was really important for exporting the RNA out of the nucleus. Now, one thing that you might or might not realize about the four examples of viruses I've given you is that all four of these viruses, their life cycle is actually in the nucleus. So what about RNAs or viruses that replicate in the cytoplasm? Can these be modified? Because I just showed you on the previous slide that modifications occur in the nucleus. So what about them? Well, there was actually some really beautiful studies that were done from um, uh, Stacy Horner's lab at Duke, and she showed that um, hepatitis C or HCV can also be modified with this M6A modification. And this modification is really important for the packaging of the viral RNA into virions, as well as um, for regulating the innate immune response. But we also know for viruses like Zika virus, dengue virus, yellow fever virus, these viruses have also harbored the M6A modification. But again, I'm going to remind you that there are more than 140 modifications. So what are these other modifications doing? Well, the first thing is that 
if we want to identify a modification or a chemical group on an RNA, how do we go about doing this? Well, there are a couple of strategies. Um, and the first three strategies really are relying on identifying a very particular type of RNA modification. So the first one is there are actually antibodies out there that will detect a RNA modification. And so here I'm showing you a Northwestern block that my student Rachel Natsban did. And it's looking at um, RNA that is from uninfected cells or cells infected with dengue. And then she used this antibody against M6A. And if you look carefully, you can see that there are some bands here in the viral RNA or they're present in the uninfected cells. So this M6A antibody has been very successfully used to identify those, that particular modification on cellular RNAs. And the way that it works is that people will isolate RNA, they will then chop it up into fragments, use that antibody to selectively pull out RNA that harbors that particular modification, and then they'll use next generation sequencing analysis to try and pinpoint where that modification is. This technique has been used, um, used with identifying uh, one methyl adenosine, five methyl cytosine, pseudouridine, four methyl cytosine, and four acetyl cytosine. There's another way in which we can do this, and this is a very similar type of approach, but instead of using an antibody, one will actually use a chemical, and this will end up modifying the, um, mod the group that is on that particular nucleotide, which you can then differentiate when you do RNA sequencing analysis. The third way to do this is that you can actually run out the um, nucleotides on by thin layer chromatography. And then if you've got particular um, if you've got particular standards, you can now actually identify what modifications you've got. Now the thing about these three types of methods is that you either need a standard or you need a reagent. So how are you going to go about identifying these 140 other modifications? Well, the strategy that you can use is one that is an unbiased detection, right? And this is mass spectrometry. And this is the technique that we use in my lab. So just briefly, I'm going to give you an introduction, is that my lab studies hepatitis C, Zika virus, and dengue virus. And we're really interested in how these viruses subvert the host RNA pathways. And of course, today, I'm telling you about how these viruses use RNA modifications. And the particular virus I'm going to tell you about is actually Zika virus. This is a virus that was first identified in 1947 um, in the Zika forest in Uganda. And for the most part, this virus, when people are infected with it, they have mild symptoms. But in 2015 and 2016, we had an outbreak in the Americas. Um, and this outbreak was associated with neurological and um, developmental defects in newborns, and adults were also developing um, Guillain-Barré syndrome. We know from, um, from this outbreak that um, Zika virus is trans primarily transmitted by mosquitoes, but it can also be transmitted sexually. And to date, we have got very limited treatment options. So understanding the fundamental is really important. All right, now I'm going to come back to our mass spectrometry. How do we actually do this? Well, what we do is we take our cells that are either uninfected or we take cells that are infected and we isolate total RNA. What we then do is we use exonucleases and we digest the long RNA into the mononucleotides. From there, we use direct infusion electrospray ionization, and then we get our mass spectrum. And if you have a look on the x-axis, you see the M over Z values, and on the y-axis, you've got the relative abundance. And immediately, you'll see four very high peaks. 
And these high peaks, they correspond to the four canonical bases, C, U, A, and G. And then the U could also be pseudouridine. But if you look much, much lower down, there are small little peaks there. And those peaks are the ones that correspond to RNA modifications. So what we do is we take those small peaks and we then generate a mass list. From this mass list, we then do our database searches and we compare against three different databases and we identify our putative hits. And what we do is we then take our putative hits and we go back and we confirm them. And so we either do this by tandem mass spectrometry where we take the nucleotide and we fragment it further, or we do it by ion mobility, where we look at how this particular uh, molecule tumbles in a vacuum. And that will then tell us what modification we have. So the data I'm gonna show you, um, we, we present in a way that my students refer to as a Skittles plot. And really what it is, is just a really bright colored table. And so, what we have is at the very top, we list the number of modifications we identified. On the left column, we list um, the modifications that, um, that we detected or didn't detect. Um, and if you've got two modifications on the same line, what this means is that they are isobaric, so they've got the same M over Z uh, value. Um, and then we've got this color gradient. And what this color gradient represents is a relative abundance. And so we refer to this as abundance versus proxy or AVP. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking the intensity of the small peaks and we're dividing it by the intensity of the sum of the four canonical bases. So the sum of the four canonical bases lands up being our internal reference or our proxy. And then we times it by 100 so we get a percentage. So if you've got warm colors, that what that means is that that modification is approaching 1%. Pseudouridine is in a much higher, um, is much higher than 1%, and so we actually introduced a grayscale. And if you go towards the cooler colors, this represents a much lower abundance. We do this with five biological replicates and five runs each, so that we get really tight statistics. If you see a white, um, box what this means is that we didn't identify that particular modification all right so what we did right is we took our cells and then we either mock infected them so no virus or we infected them with um, zika virus and this is what we found right we found in our uninfected cells we identified 47 different rna modifications but in our Zika virus infected cells, we identified 44 different modifications. So immediately you can see that there are some trends here. So first, there are some modifications that disappear during virus infection. There are some modifications that don't disappear, but they do decrease in intensity. There are other modifications that increase in intensity and then there was one particular modification that we were very excited to identify is actually the um, dimethylcytosine modification. So this is um, the 5-2'-methyl dimethylcytosine or N4-N4 dimethylcytosine. And what was really interesting is that this particular modification we also identified during other viral infections. All right, so this is looking at just Zika virus infection in mammalian cells. And if you think back to a couple of slides ago, one of the things that I told you is that Zika virus can actually be transmitted by mosquitoes. So just as a reminder, in the forest, um, mosquitoes may land up um, infecting um, apes. And so this is how the mosquito or the, the Zika virus infection cycle is transmitted and maintained. If there is some spillover and a mosquito will infect a human, this human can then actually end up propagating the virus through what we refer to as the urban cycle, where we've either got our Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus as being the viruses that are responsible for transmitting um, this virus. So, 
we asked the question was how does the post-transcriptional RNA modification landscape change between mammalian and mosquito hosts during Zika virus infection? To answer this question, what we did is that in collaboration with Alex Ciotta at Wadsworth, which is New York State Labs, we infected Aedes aegypti mosquitoes with Zika virus. So what we did was that we gave the mosquitoes a blood meal that was either just a blood meal or a blood meal that had Zika virus in it. The mosquitoes were allowed to feed for 30 minutes and then we separated those out, um, the mosquitoes that had blood in their bellies versus those that hadn't fed. We waited two weeks and then we collected the mosquitoes. What we did was that we took the mosquitoes um, that were either mock infected or infected with Zika virus, put them into um, a small tube, homogenized them with a BB, and then did a trisole extraction to harvest the RNA. We did qPCR to identify whether the mosquitoes were indeed infected or whether they were uninfected. And then we did mass spec. So in total, what we had is that we had 32 different um, mosquitoes that were mock infected and 39 that had been infected with Zika virus. So if we now go back to our Skittles plot, which I'm showing you here, again, what we've got is we've got the RNA modifications that we identified in this first column. Then we've got our 32 mosquitoes that were mock infected or the 39 mosquitoes that were infected with Zika virus where each column represents one particular um, mosquito. So this table is overwhelming. And I will show you some more clearer data on the next slide. But one of the reasons that I like showing it is that you really do get an appreciation for the variability that there is between different organisms, right, from one mosquito to the next. But if you look carefully, you can see there are some trends. For instance, these, um, this area over here, you see that you're now detecting some modifications that you didn't identify earlier. This one over here, you've now got more of that particular modification. So if we take all of these modifications and we actually collapse them down, what we find is that if we look at the modifications on the x-axis versus the abundance, um, the abundance versus proxy on the y-axis. What we immediately notice is that during um, Zika virus infection, we see this increase in the number of nucleotides that have been monomethylated. So this means that they have got a methyl group either on the nitrogenous base or on the ribose sugar. And then this quickly drops off for the other modifications. So, Up until now, I've shown you RNA in terms of the whole cell. What about can the viral RNA be modified? Well, I already told you that M6A or N6 methyl adenosine had been identified on the viral RNA. What we wanted to know was what about those other modifications? And so to do this, what we did is we used an affinity capture approach where we isolated RNA, we then annealed antisense biotinylated oligonucleotides to specifically pull out viral RNA, which we were able to do through a strept avidin bead. We then eluted and we did our mass spec. So here I'm showing you the data in a little bit of a different form, but it shows you really nicely that there is a difference between RNA of viral RNA that was isolated inside of the cell versus RNA that was isolated from virions that had been released from the cell. So what I've got on the x-axis is we've got the particular types of modifications. On the y-axis, we've got the abundance versus proxy. So for the viruses inside of the cell, we identified 32 different modifications. For RNA that had been packaged into virions, we identified 41 different modifications. What was gratifying is that we identified 30 modifications between the two groups, but we also identified that M6A modification that had been previously found, the M7G, which was important because we know that the viral RNA has a cap. 
What we also identified is that there are some modifications that are unique to the intracellular RNA. Um, and then there are modifications that are also unique to the viral RNA that is being released from the cell. And here again, we saw that that dimethylcytosine species that we identified only on the um, only during viral infection was now present on Zika virus RNA that had been released from the cell. So it's tantalizing to hypothesize that maybe this particular type of modification is there as a signal again that this RNA should be packaged into the viral capsid and be released from the cell. So what have I told you today? I hope that you will take away from this is that RNA can be modified with chemical groups and there are so many different modifications out there. The other is that the type of modification will actually influence the function. And you can have many different types of functions as a result of those particular modifications. But from the data I showed you, right, is that during viral infection, when you have something perturbing the cellular homeostasis, that causes a dramatic change in the RNA modification landscape. But what's even more exciting is that the viral RNA is modified. And it's not just modified with an M7G cap or one modification. It can have upwards of 30 or 40 different RNA modifications on the viral RNA. And so this then brings the question like, well, what next? Where do we go from here? Well, what ultimately what we want to know is what are these modifications doing during viral infection? So one way we can ask the question is to say, well, let's think about those enzymes that are responsible for either putting on the modification, removing the modification, or interpreting the function, right, and contributing to it. So if we know what those enzymes are, we can potentially manipulate the system and then ask, what happens? Do we now see an effect on the virus infection? The second way would be to identify where those modifications are within the viral genome and then go in and mutate those particular sites and ask, well, what is the consequence? And these are all really terrific ideas, but they're actually really challenged when it comes to um, looking at RNA modifications. For one, we've got very few um, reagents, such as antibodies or chemicals that we can modify the RNA. Um, and for a lot of these modifications, we don't really know what the enzymes are. So this is an incredibly exciting field with lots to explore, um, but also faced with some challenges that my lab is really excited about um, undertaking. So last, um, I just want to highlight, um, this is my lab over here from Halloween last year. And, um, the person who did most of the work was Rachel Nesband and um, Gaston Bonenfund. A, in my collaborator's lab, Dan Fabris, Will McIntyre also contributed at Wadsworth and Alex Ciotta's lab. Sean was also contributing towards the mosquito work. And of course, I want to thank our funding sources as well as our collaborators for other re uh, for reagents. Thank you very much.